You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 423. You cannot always control what goes on outside, but you can always control what goes on inside. Wayne Dyer. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Today's show is also sponsored by the Film Distribution Blueprint. If you want to avoid being taken advantage of by predatory film distributors, this is the course for you. If you want to check it out, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash let me in. Now, guys, today on the show, we have filmmaker, producer, screenwriter, and fellow podcaster, Giles Alderson. And Giles is the host of the Filmmakers Podcast, a very popular podcast over in the UK. Now, I've had the pleasure of being on his show multiple times, and we were talking the other day about uh, his first film. And when he told me that his first film had a million-dollar budget, I was like, you mean your debut feature film was a million bucks? How the hell did that happen? He goes, it's a hell of a story. So he started telling me the story. I'm like, dude, you've got to come on the show and we got to talk about this. So that's what we did. And it is a hell of a tale that he weaves in regards to how he got this movie made, his just the adventures, the misadventures, everything that went on on making his film and uh, and what he's doing now, his new projects, how that film led to his next project, and so on and so forth. And and Giles is just an awesome, awesome guy, and I am proud to call him my friend. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Giles Alderson. I'd like to welcome to the show Giles Alderson. How are you doing, my friend? I am good, thank you, Alex. It's an absolute delight, honestly, to be here with you. Honestly. Yeah, thank you for coming on the show, man. You know, we've... We've known each other for a little while now. Um, you have uh, an amazing podcast called The Filmmaker's Podcast, which I've, I've been uh, blessed and honored to be on as, uh, as a guest as well. Twice. 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 Yes, I'm a, I'm a two-timer. Yes, I'm yeah, a two-timer. Yes, two-time. I, I am a, I'm a two-timer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, um, and we also uh, work together a little bit on your uh, documentary, which we'll talk about later as well. Um, but before we get going, man, how did you get into the business? You see, it's a it's a really interesting one for me because obviously it, it, the quicker version of it is I was an actor for years. But getting to be an actor was a careers advisor in school. And she said to me, because I was like, I'm going to be a footballer, a soccer player. I, this is all I'm going to do. I'm going to play for England. I was a goalkeeper. And she said to me, she said, yeah, yeah. Well, while you're waiting for that to happen, I saw you in a school play and I heard you, you know, a course at college while you wait for the football. Uh, mm-hmm. And I went to this performing arts college and I fell in love with 
the people, the girls, the the idea of it. And I wasn't getting any of the roles, but I wanted it. And I got the bug and I fell in love and football didn't happen for me, sadly. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. It might, you know, you never know one day. And then I got into acting. And from there, I'd put on plays at the Royal Court in London and the Soho Theatre, which I'd written and I'd sometimes direct them. And it was just an absolute joy to sort of be involved and behind the scenes. But I wanted to be an actor, not a filmmaker. I, people kept saying you should really direct shorts. You go do something like that. And I shied away from it for so long. And luckily, I, I, I managed to be in some great films. I Want Candy and The Damned United and loads of TV. And The Damned United was a football movie, a soccer movie. So I got to fulfill <laughs> my two dreams of being a professional footballer, <laughs> but actually acting away. Um, and then we wrote a pilot for the BBC. The BBC were interested in this pilot that our team at the time were we were writing. And they said, go off and shoot, shoot a pilot. We said, OK, all right, great. We can do that. And the director pulled out um, almost last minute. So I went. I'm going to do it. I am going to do this. And I fell in love with directing on the spot. I went, this is amazing. I didn't know what it was. It was just the the delight of being on set and actually calling the shots and being in control. Oh, it's when addictive. You say to the, it's addictive. The camera guy, you know, so actually I just like to move this shot around here and come, and they do it. And you're like, what <laughs> are you actually doing what I'm saying? Uh, does this make sense? And yeah, choosing the colors and the palette and the costumes and, I then spent the next part of 10 years trying to be a director and it was very difficult being the actor because people were very much like you, uh, you're an actor mate, you know, and it was very hard to get take, be taken seriously as a director. So whenever I went for directing gigs, I just didn't talk about the acting and I started to make music videos and promos and brand media and films for banks and whatever I could get my hands on to learn about filmmaking. And yeah, that's pretty much how I got into it. Very cool. Now your but your first film um mm. is very interesting your debut film um yeah. it's it's not the standard fair um no. for uh, so so can you tell the story about how you uh, how what what was the story behind your debut film sir so to get to my debut film i it like i say it took a long time and during that time i got burnt so much by predatory producers by my lack of understanding about what a director slash producer slash screenwriter should do and be. And I was forever in people's heads and I didn't feel I belonged and constantly relying on other people to make those decisions. I was always hearing things third party, you know, someone else would have a meeting and it get passed down and now oh, it's not working out or there'd always be an issue. You know, we had Jason Statham attached to one project at one time. We had Fox attached to another project. And every single time I wasn't the person speaking to the person, if you like, there was always two or three people in between. And it wound me up so much that I'd hear this third hand. And by then it had been diluted and diluted and diluted. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't take it anymore. Um, and some during that whole process, I got uh, ripped off. And those projects got taken away from me and I didn't have any control. So what I decided to do was take back control. I decided to write my own projects fully. I decided to produce my own projects and I decided to say, I am directing this and no one's going to take it away from me this time. And I had learned massively about doing that and about being strong and about being vibrant and about actually when you do that, people take you seriously. If mm -hmm. you're there going, I'm directing this, if you're not going to put the money in because I'm directing it or if you're not going to be in it because I'm directing it, then you're not going to be in it. I'm not doing it with you. Whereas in the past, I was so scared that I think it is interesting story. There was, there was one project we were doing where I'd found the investor. I'd found the script. I'd found the actors. And there were some big actors. I'd got it all going. It was great. And then suddenly I get a call from one of the investors, one of them saying, oh, there's, there's a bit of a situation. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, speak to the producer. The producer was now not returning calls. <laughs> it seemed to be that the uh, writer and producer had gone behind my back and put the option in a different name and then brought my investors to them. And the investor then, I then rang back up the investor, said, what are you doing? Why dare you do this? And he said, don't worry, we'll give you an associate producer credit. It'd be really good for your career. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I fought. So this is the time where I changed. And I fought back and I said, I'm not having this anymore. 
I said I'll take it to court. I'm going to take this further. I am not having this. Agents were being really dickheads, and I just fought back. I said, I've had enough, and I fought back, and it changed. The film didn't happen, which is sad in some ways, but also, do you know what? I stuck up for myself. And all filmmakers need to do that. Mm-hmm. You've just spout about this all the time. And it's so true. It's your project. And if you want to go make a film, you have to be strong. And I don't mean be a dick. And I don't mean be obtrusive and in the way. You've just got to be strong and powerful and passionate about your project that people want to work with you. And that's kind of how my first project, The Dare, came about. So I'm now in this place where I, I'm struggling to get a project made. I'm struggling for people to take me seriously. And I went to see a friend's film called Amit Gupta. And he'd made some big movies with some big people. And he just made this $100,000 romantic comedy. And I said to him afterwards, I said, mate, that was fantastic. But why have you gone from making these two, three million pound studio movies, even bigger in some cases, with big names, to making this with no names and no money? He went, because I'm in control. And I got to make a movie how I wanted to make a movie. And he turned to me and said, why are you not making a movie? And I said, oh, because, because, because. And he went, go home tonight, find a project and go make it for whatever budget you can go make it for. And then you'll be taken seriously. And I took him at his word. And that night I went home, found a script that I was so passionate about. And I went out and I said, right, I'm going to make this movie. During that time, obviously, bits and pieces happened. And I said, I'm also going to write something myself. But that writer of that other project, I brought him on to my project, which was called The Dare. And it was two ideas I'd had sat in a notebook on my desk here. And at one point I was, I was reading through ideas and I went, why don't I stick them together? There's, there's four people in a basement and we don't know why they're there. And then above there's an old man and he's got a kid and we don't know their relationship, but it's not his kid. And I thought, why don't I tie these stories together? Why don't they connect somehow? And that was it. It was like a light bulb went off in my head. Now I have this story. And within literally a week, I'd written the whole treatment out, almost 70 pages of this treatment. And I went to my another producer at the time and things happened and fell down. And then I went back to this writer and I said, do you want to write this with me? And within a month, we had a really great first draft. And the story carries on from there and it it gets better. (laughs) So, yeah. so, so what's the next step after that? So, cause I know you, you know, you, you got this movie made, uh, yeah. but, how, but how you got it made is not usual with the first time no. director. No, it's quote not. unquote. It's really not. Yeah. Quote unquote, first time director. And this is, this is interesting. So I'm now got the dare. It's a script ready. There's interest. There's proper interest now from new producers and people are very excited. It's a commercial prospect. It's a very Saw-esque gore film, but with much more psychological led themes. And people are going, well, we could make money here. This is great. But no one was actually putting their hand in their pocket. And my good friend Julian Kostoff, who we acted together in, in a really bad advert years ago for Panasonic, he said, well, listen, I'm, I'm producing now. I've made loads of stuff in Bulgaria. Bits, I've acted and stuff. Can I, can I send this script to the studio in, in Bulgaria? And I said, yeah, of course, whatever, thinking nothing of it. And literally, I think a couple of weeks later, we got report back from the script um, readers over in New Boyana Studios. And I'll tell you more about them in a second. But they came back with a great a really great review saying yeah we could shoot this here does the filmmaker want to do it here get in touch so julian said this is amazing look what we've got here this is great um so we got in touch with the studio and uh, there at new boyana and they said listen we love this but we're not going to make this now so come back in a year go try and make it then we'll make it with you we potentially you know all that we said all right fine we knew that they were connected to Millennium, which Millennium Media, who do amazing films or action, big action films like yeah. Hellboy, London Has Fallen, Rambo recently. We thought, wow, this could be a really great in. Should we wait a year? Because now we've got this other producer here in the UK who's saying, I can give you 150 grand. We can go make this. But I just didn't believe him. You know, when you saw shocking, 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 shocking. I mean, it's so shocking. It's so shocking, Jazz. <laughs> shocking. And I, there was something about him that was just not right. There was just something. And I, but I was like, but I want to make a movie. I need to make a movie. I'm desperate now by this point. For those filmmakers out there who know what I was going through, who were going through that, you're desperate to make a film. And it was my baby and I could do this. And suddenly this guy's offering some sort of money to go make it. So we went through another month of pre-production and we were about to sign the deal and go through this. And to be honest, it could have been an absolute shit show of... <sighs> 
I did, you know, when you just think, is this real? Is it not? Is the money really going to turn up? Is it really going to be 60 grand? Is people going to run away with this money that he's saying he's got? And it all seemed really dodgy. There's some dodgy people involved. And, oh, Again, oh, shocking. 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 Again. So, so, so the money, the money is going to drop any day now. That's, that's, yeah, the, exactly. that's the word. Drop every day. But we were very far advanced with pre-production and looking at locations and all this and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So Julian went, look, I'm going to go back to the studio again and just knock on that door one more time and tell them we've got money. This is your last chance to make this movie. Do you want to do it? And he calls me back after he called them. And he said, you'll never guess what I said. What he said, if you fly over tomorrow, they're going to see you. And I went, what? He said, you fly to Bulgaria tomorrow. And this is like 5 PM at night. They will see you. And I'm like, Oh my God, I drop everything. I look at flights. I go, Oh God, that's way too expensive for my price range. But okay, you've got to do this. This is an opportunity to go to a major studio. Well, it's an adventure. It's, it's an adventure. It's an oh adventure yeah. For one thing, fly to Bulgaria. Let's do this. So I practiced my pitch. I booked, I, I said, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's book the flight. They said they'd pay for the hotel. I said, great. I'll stay for the night. They said, if you, and then I spoke to them. I said, yeah, if you um, come over, here's the flight details. Here's your hotel details now. Um, we will show you around the studio. So I booked the flight on the time that they'd suggested. Done. I'm sitting on this flight on my own, absolutely cacking myself. I don't know what to expect. <laughs> this is crazy. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm actually going to a film studio to, to pitch my movie. Is this real? They like it. We know they like it. I get to the hotel and they say, uh, okay, Yarev is the exec who's running the show. He says he's a bit busy right now, so just chill here for a bit. I said, okay. I'm now in Bulgaria in some hotel. I, I can't go out. I've got no money. I've got, I, I can't afford to literally eat. I'm like, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? And eventually he shows up, and he's this wonderful, charismatic, interesting guy. And he's just like, hey, really laid back, almost like in flip-flops and a T-shirt. And I'm like, really? This guy runs this studio? Okay, cool. All right. Fair hair, tall as well, like a bear. I'm like, wow. Uh, okay. And he says, so tell me about your movie. And I went, okay, well, you've, you've seen the picture. So what, what do I need to tell you? He went, nah, I know nothing. And I went, <sighs> deep breath, go for it. And this is huge advice I can give to any filmmakers is know your pitch inside out. Be fully prepared to bullshit if you have to, but know it so well that it's like you're telling your mates down the pub. Know it so well that it's exciting, it's enticing, that they really think, okay, this guy knows what he's doing because, or guy or girl, because they're investing in you. And this is a secret I've only learned recently. I got my movie made because of how I pitched it and how I talked about this movie and how I was passionate about it. Because if I'd come across all, um, well, I just, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of excited to make that. Would done. they have gone with me? Done. I'm done. I'm out the door. So I had to pretend to be, I pretend, and I mean pretend because you are absolutely kicking yourself, to know what you're talking about. I've not made a movie. I'm now, I made a studio and they're going, well, should, why should I invest in you? Why should I put our hard-earned money into you so i i gave my best pitch i did as strong as i could and i sold myself <laughs> to high heaven he said great thank you i like your idea i like you i need to think about this and i said okay but you know we've got um a uk producer ready to go we're about to sign the deal bullshit bullshit but yeah it's kind of true but you know not and he said yeah but I need time to think about it. So if you want to take that deal, take it. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, you don't play. You can't. You can't, don't. Don't be playing hardball. Did that? That so, the wrong game. That so let, all right. So real quick, I want. I want to stop you there for a second, because so everyone listening, mm -hmm. there's a moment to play hardball, or not even hardball, but to play that game of like, well, you know, there's another couple on the lot that wants to buy this car, and if you don't buy oh. it now, by the next twenty minutes, it's gonna have to go. That only works if the person that you're selling to really wants and has no other options. Like they're in love with your project or your car for the, for the analogy sake. That because was, he was like a studio head. He had never even heard about it. At least that's what he said and yeah. wanted to hear all of that. That's not the play. And you could have very easily screwed up yes. at that moment. It could have been, he could have said, you know what? Why don't you just go off and do that? Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm. It just luck. Is that fair? 
totally fair totally fair and luck was on my side that i again i i came prepared as in not only was i very good with the pitch and and passionate but i also came with a ton of photos a ton of moods a ton of images even a reel nice. a rip reel i came with what you'd come is if you were making the movie tomorrow color nice. palettes costume ideas casting ideas even at that point we pretty much cast the movie it, it, everything i could think of from listening to your amazing podcast, from oh, listening you. to people and books that I've read about how to go in and pitch yourself and just being clever about it and thinking. And my main tip there as well would be, I didn't just talk about the movie and this is interesting and a really fine line because it's just me and him in a hotel. You know, we ha- hadn't gone to the studio. He'd come to the hotel and he said, we're sitting in this echoey chamber of this really weird Eastern European gold like <laughs> hotel that I was put in. And it's just me and him. So I also went on to his level. I also talked to him as a person. I tried to see if he was interested in soccer. No, he wasn't. I tried to see if he was interested. Whatever he was interested in, we talked about. But I got him to like me. I got him to be interested in me as a person because he had no idea if I could make a movie. He had no idea if my film was any good or if I could actually shoot anything. He was interested in me. And what cleverly he did was he kept passing the buck back to me and asking about me and what I did and how I, anything to not talk about the film, if you like. So I'm like, oh, have I done enough? Have I done enough? So he says, okay, well, you, you okay, you've got the other film, you've the other producers, but you choose what you want to do. But I'm coming to London in a month. I'm going to bring my other producer with me. If you're still interested, we're going to pitch again then. I said, I said, absolutely. He said, first of all, though, I'm going to take you around the studio. And I want you to tell me if you think you can shoot your movie in this studio. Now, obviously, I'm thinking Beautiful. Now, oh, masterful. Well, of masterful. course. It's I don't masterful. need to see it. Obviously, I looked at the photos. I looked at the whole place. There's no question about it. When someone says, can you shoot your movie in a studio? You, yeah. So and at that point, I'm going, well, great. Yeah, it'd be really good to look at some of the locations and the ideas. Yeah, great. Take me around. I walk into this studio. New Bayana Studios is gorgeous. It's basically, they've got New York set, New York Street. It looks like New York. They've got London Street. They've got a gulag. They've got forests. They've got everything you can imagine. And 16 studio spaces. Gorgeous. So obviously, I walk around like a kid in a candy shop going, oh, my God, look at this place. Proper tour with the proper people who run the, the, the studio. Yariv's gone off now doing something else. And eventually I go back because I'm waiting for my flight and they just sit me in an, in an office for a while. And then he eventually comes back and he says, so, could you shoot your movie here? And I look at him in, very seriously and look him in the eyes and I say, no. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. No. A, this is a cesspool. This is absolutely cesspool. It's horrible. And we have a laugh about it. And I say, of course I can. I've got plans. I know how we could do the forest. Uh, you know, the usual. He says, great. Fantastic. Lovely to meet you. I've got to go. Good luck with your flight back. I'm coming to London in a month. Excellent. I go back. I'm like, what are we going to do to Julian? He's like, well, of course, we've got to wait now. We've got to wait. So we're sort of fobbing the other producer off a bit. And I don't mean that in a nasty way. He was also all over the place. So it worked out well. A month later, he comes back uh, to he comes to London and he sits down with his line producer. And the same thing happened again. We hardly talked about the movie at all. I had to pitch it as if I'd never pitched it before. I had to describe it as I've never had before. We talked about everything and anything as well, apart from the film. And he got to know me. He got to know Julian really well. And his love, other producer was brilliant. And we got on brilliantly. And again, I still believe this. The real reason I got that film made was because he liked me. It it didn't really matter about the film. Of course it did. Of course it was important. But what was important was me and the fact that he felt, I've got to work with this kid for two, three, and actually, as it's turned out, four years um, before the films got released in the UK. And we'll come to that, if you like, of why it took so long. And there we are. Um, And suddenly now, um, after that meeting, he goes, great. Okay, well, we'd like to do the movie. And I, I, I'm literally burning up inside and my heart is racing and I, I, I'm, I'm trying to keep it cool. Mm-hmm. And I go, OK, good, good. All right. Yeah. Well, I think we could. I think I think we could do. He said, well, how are you going to do with the other producer? And I went, I think we'll be all right. I think we'll be able to do with this. We're going to make right. that work. We'll make that We're work on our end. We'll make, make it work on our end. We'll make it work. And again, we hadn't signed anything with the producer. And it wasn't like it was a, a, a anything. It was, a, again, it was all pie in the sky and talk and a, just another sort of fake investor producer. He's still not, he's not gone and made any other films. And he's not. So it was another one of those fake things. So sure. I'm so glad it didn't go that way. 
Um, and then I spent three months in Bulgaria um, prepping the movie in their movie studios, talking about how we're going to make this movie. And <laughs> so it was cool. just incredible. You know, you literally walk in there. Yeah, I had no idea which studio was going to be mine and they're going to build it. And we're designing how we're going to build the basement and build the farmhouse. And it was just a magical And time. this is your first film. And this is my debut movie and it's with, you know, Millennium Media and it's with B2Y and it's a studio in New Buyana. And there I am, this kid who's written something with his pal Johnny Grant and suddenly now my other pal Julian Kostov is now producing this, if you like, Hollywood movie and I'm directing it as my debut movie. And um, I can tell you now. I was shitting myself. <laughs> well, no, I mean, uh, anyone listening here is like, hey. Jesus, like this is, it's the dream, but it's the nightmare all at the same time. I wanted to back up on something in your, in your story where you kept saying that like, they talked about everything except the movie. Yes. And the reason, and, and the reason I want the audience to understand the reason why they do that is because they already know the project is something they're interested in or of quality. That's not the, because they have 20 of those. On the mm-hmm. on the desk, at it's yeah. like you know th- this is not Avatar. Not usual, I mean, yeah, yeah. This is this is they have twenty other projects who are of equal or better quality or markability or money yeah. making potential. It's all there, but the X factor is always the filmmaker. It's always you, and I've been in those meetings as well where mm-hmm. they're just feeling you out because I'm going to have to go down the road with this guy or yeah. this girl for the next year to two, if not longer, can I work with this person? And regardless if it's the best script in the world, if you're a dick, yep, it is done. It's over. And that's why they kind of played that game because they were – you could tell that that's a, that's a seasoned producer. That's a seasoned filmmaker who, who walked you through those paces and, like, and then made you wait a month on top of that because he could have easily yeah. greenlit it while you were there. Of course. He could have just said, yeah, we want to do it. What do we want to do? No, he let you wait for a month. Let's see how this all Mm -hmm. plays out. This is all a game. And this is something that is completely unwritten in, in, in the, in the, in the game playbook. In the game manual of making films. It's just unwritten that. And I think it's vital. It's so important that filmmakers understand that it is them. They are the ones that get films made. They are the ones I I produce movies now, you know, It's, it's my journey of that since that time has I've produced movies and I'm working with people I want to work with. If for one can know this as well as I making a film is one of the hardest things you might do. It's torturous. It's hard work. If you're in the trenches with someone who's a bit of a dick, not even a massive dick, a bit of a dick, you're going, I can't be bothered. I've got other things. I'd rather make my own project and God forbid me be a dick on that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so, also, yeah, as you and also as huge. as you get older, you just start your tolerance yeah. for that. Like when you're twenty something, your tolerance for that is very high. Like things I did at my twenties, I look back now, I'm like, oh my god, I would never. But when you're young and hungry, you deal with a lot of stuff that you would not deal with as you get older. But um, yes, it, it's so true. Yeah. So much like as as I even in my post business, I would start. We're talking to potential clients and I'll be just like, "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we could do this for this much, but let's talk about you. And I would just start feeling them out. And I'm like, oh no, this guy's going to be a nightmare. If you, yeah, I would have done it for 20,000, but it's going to be 50. If I got to put up with you, I need to be paid for this pain. (laughs) Absolutely right. Absolutely. Um, and and when I, and interestingly, when I was in that three month period, I actually think it might've ended up being longer. We hadn't got a start date and this was freaking me out because I'm now in Bulgaria away from my family Mm -hmm. in a hotel room pretty much on my own a lot of the time getting ferried to the studio and we didn't have a start date because the next uh, London has fallen or movies come in or Adrian Brody's now shooting or Antonio Banderas is now shooting and the studio, oh, it's been pushed, it's been pushed, it's been pushed and this freaked me out so much that at one point, um, sadly, my uh, missus is... uh, uh, dad had died so i was like no. okay i need to fly back but if i fly back this could be a real problem and the film might just die because it's me pushing it here i'm in the studio again please give me a start date please my actors are now going is this really happening the agents are knocking on the door and julian's going oh god what are we gonna do so i said i'm gonna fly back and i i'm gone and i kind of knew at that point 
if they don't green light it while I'm gone, this might not happen. And it was a risk. And I remember, I think I was back a week and a half after the funeral, and I called up Yariv and I said, Yariv, this needs to be the start date. And this needs to be when we start the edit because of my cast and because of the edit. Is this possible? Please tell me this This is a go. And he said, OK, let's do it. And it was it was such a weird thing that that was the green light. That was the moment. And whether it was me flying back and not being in the vicinity and not knocking on the door all the time and not being a pest. I'm not that I was doing that at all. I was just in this zone. But mm-hmm. there was something about that that was really interesting. From that moment, it was all there's the start date. And then it moved forward. I just wanted to talk about that because I found that really fascinating as a as a thing. Why did that happen? Why? And, and that whole time, the whole time, really, I was thinking I'm a fraud. Any moment now, they're just oh, no. going to go, Giles, it's not you. It's, sorry, we made a mistake. No, it, we opened the wrong door. You, imposter, it, you. imposter, imposter syndrome. syndrome. And oh, no, it's God. it is something. It is a disease that runs rampant through the filmmaking community and screenwriting community. <clears throat> is that whole like, oh, they're going to figure me out. Look, I still feel that way sometimes. We all do. I've talked to big, you know, I've interviewed big filmmakers, big screenwriters. And, you know, I ask them sometimes either on the show or off the show. And they go, yeah, I still, I still feel I'm like, but you want an Oscar. And they're mm-hmm. like, yeah, I still kind of feel like, How you know, they? look, Henry, was it, was it Henry Fonda? <clears throat> I think it was Henry Fonda. Every time he would go on to do a play, yeah. Right before he would go on, he'd throw up. Yeah, absolutely. At seventy, think, at seventy-five, at seventy-five. I think Judy Dench still does that. Now. <clears throat> you know, we had uh, Christy Wilson Cairns, the writer, a screenwriter of nineteen seventeen, on the podcast recently. She mm-hmm. said the same thing. She had a constant. She's now writing Star Wars. She says, "I constantly feel that I'm an imposter. I feel any minute now they're going to go. You can't write. Why are you here?" And we feel that too. And it, but because it was my first movie. But it was just this really weird. I didn't feel like I'd prove myself in any way, shape, or form. And uh, another interesting story with Yariv. Another point, I was sat down with him, and he, I'd made all these shorts, award-winning shorts, and docs, and promos, and whatever. And he said, um, "So I'm going to tell you what a, a, f- a first AD does. I'm going to tell you who calls action. I'm going to." And I was like, "Oh no, no, I, I know." But you know, when you think, "Oh, if I say I know, is he going to think, well, hang on?" But he just kind of explained what how a set works, and I thought, "Hang on, are you? Hang, do you, you think, think like? Me, do you think yeah, like you me all this I know money nothing? I know nothing. I've never <clears> been on a movie set before." And it was a really interesting moment that I just looked at Julian, and he looked at me, and went, "Shut up, just let him let him talk." And it was just an amazing moment that you just go, "Okay." Cool, so, fine. so this is this, let's dissect that for a second. So, yeah. this man who's giving you seven figures, seven figures sure. to make the, seven figures to make this film. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Which is insane. Um, it's insane. It's insane. It's insane. Uh, I've worked on a project that there was a first time director that had a million dollars and boy, did that didn't go well. Um, like really, really badly. So anytime you give a seven figure deal to of a first time director, I, you know, it's, you, you really are rolling the dice. So yeah. he, he basically gave you the shot based mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on the script and yeah. you. Not yes. your experience, not where you came from. And he was like so confident in who you are as a human being that he's mm-hmm. like, oh, I could teach you how to direct. I could teach you. You have vision and we'll get, we'll get good people around you and we'll get the movie made. Mm-hmm. But you have, you're the driving force behind it, but you just need some help technically and we can help you with that. That is the sign of a very seasoned producer. Someone mm-hmm. who, and I've, I've spoken to those guys and I've met those guys. And when you speak to people at that level, you just, they're just at a completely different, yeah, different. wavelength. Because normally, yeah. you and I, you know, when we're coming up, we're dealing with the schmucks, the guys who oh, are like, I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm, I got the money, I got this investor over that here, guy. I got that yeah. guy, and I got, yeah. how much do you want? Three million? That's nothing. I spit oh, three million. Yeah. Uh, I, I throw that away <laughs> in the morning. Ah, uh, all that stuff. <laughs> how much do you need? Like all that kind of stuff. And that's yeah. these posers are what most filmmakers deal with are posers, people who are pretending mm-hmm. or they're acting like they're the big shots. But did you notice in your story so far, when you met this guy, he showed up and almost flip flops in a t-shirt and he ran the studio. Why? Because yeah. he wasn't trying to impress anyone. He was so comfortable Absolutely. with who he was and yeah. what he does that he doesn't need to impress you. But the no. dude shows up in a $5,000 suit. 
you know, and from my experience dealing with these kind of big producers, they don't do that. No. They don't, they don't show off like that. They'll just, no. they might be dicks. They might be arrogant. They might be other things, but they generally don't show up. And if they do, they're so insecure. It's mm-hmm. fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. But he so was I, very yeah, secure. I, I got my shot because of that. I absolutely agree. He, he, he liked me. He believed in what I could do in my vision. And I constantly was telling him my vision. I was constantly updating. I was doing storyboards for days and days and days. With oh, that. Yeah. They gave me a storyboard artist, for God's sake. And I was like, oh, okay, They're like, well, how are you going to do? I was like, ah, oh. so now I've got to think about how to draw it. You know, I knew how to make it look, but to draw it, I'm like, so I used Lego figures. And this is really, I went to the shop nearby and I got a load of Lego figures because again, I'm in Bulgaria. Not everyone's great at English, you know, that some people are brilliant, but not everyone. So when you're trying to talk two shot or a specific angle you want, it doesn't really translate. So mm-hmm. I've got these little mini Lego figures and I, I put a, a, a dagger in one of their hands and I just kept moving them around this, you know, because most of it's set in a basement. And I just take photos of it. I'd say, OK, I'm going to shoot from this angle. I'll do that. And she'd go, oh, OK, cool. And it made a huge difference to understanding my vision. And yeah, I, but you're right. He, he believed in me and based on the script and me. And that is a huge lesson to any filmmaker out there is that is what it's about. This world is that. Obviously, you've got to be talented and you've got to know what you're doing. And I'm sure he'd done his homework. Yeah, no, no. I I promise you the whole I don't know anything. That's no, no. (laughs) I promise you he knew what was going on. He probably read the script. He probably listened to the pitch. He just wanted to hear you say it. Um, There's no way a man like that's just going to show up going – yeah, what, yeah. What's, what, what, so what are you about? Like, he's not going to yeah. get in a car, drive to your hotel. It's a, that's, nah, nah, no chance. No there's chance. no chance what, at all. But I, I, want, I want to make this very clear to everyone listening. Your story is an anomaly. It is, it is an outlier. It is not the norm. And mm. from someone who's been hustling in the business for 25 years, you're the first positive example Wow. Of someone having a million dollar plus seven figure plus film and in their first film and mm. not just epically throwing the money away, your ego gets out of hand. But how old were you when you made this? It was four years ago. It was four so, years ago we shot. Yeah, man, you're you're not a kid. No, I was definitely not a kid. Yeah, sure. yeah, no. yeah, so it's it's a little bit different. I promise you, if you would have been ten years younger, this wouldn't have happened. I agree. Totally. He, agree. he wouldn't have given what? it I'm, to you. He, he wouldn't have. have, and I'm glad because back then, when I was trying to make the movies, like say the eight year period of trying to do that up until that four years ago, I wouldn't have been ready. You know, like I say, when I had Jason Statham, when we had Fox, I wasn't ready for that. That's why it didn't happen. As much as it hurt and I cried in my pillow and all these things when it all fell down. And, oh, yeah. and, and the other thing as well is I only had one project. And I'm never doing that again. Have more than one. Have ten. So that you, if one falls down, it's not the end of the world. Back then I had one. But yeah, it, it's, it is an anomaly and I'm, I'm amazed. And do you know what? I, I worked so hard when we were shooting and I, I gave it everything. And do you know what? Fantastically, it's done really well. Done so, really yeah, so, well how did it, so why did it take so long to get out? So it took so long to get up because it's a studio movie and it we needed to do pickups. Basically, the last part of the movie originally was they come out of the the cabin, if you like, uh, you know, not to give any spoilers away of the film. But it, it, was, it was snowing on the day we needed to shoot during our principal photography. So we were like, don't worry, we'll come back and shoot in a month's time. When you've had a look at the edit, you can do some other pickups then. He'd already promised me, and this was interesting, he only came to set twice or three times. And both those times, he literally almost walked right onto in the middle of where the camera was. He just walked on. And I'm there. I'm there literally with, with our young kid who's playing young Dominic. And I'm and I could see someone out the corner where I'm like, why is there someone stood there? I think any minute now I'm going to go, I'm sorry, you can't be there. There's a, there's a camera coming through and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm directing this kid and I'm really going into detail. It was a great moment for him to be stood there watching me really direct this kid to try and get the performance. And I look up and there he is just stood there sort of half smiling at me going, cool. Uh, and he pulls me. I'm so glad it was that moment and not maybe another moment where I'd maybe not doing what I'm supposed to do or whatever. And, and he pulls me aside and he says, look, we're, we're really happy with where it's going. I'm going to give you two extra pickup days. And I went, 
can I have them now? <laughs> I said, can, can I finish? I, I need them. I'm desperate. We we had originally we had one bit to shoot that really should take six days, and in the end we got two days at night. It was an, and it shouldn't have been a, anyway. That I can go into that another time. But he pulled me aside and I said, you, you get an extra two days. And I said, uh, can I have them now? And he said, no. You'll need them later. I promise you, when you look at the edit, you'll need them. So anyway, so I knew I had these two days. So when the snow felt fall came, uh, I was like, okay, well, we'll have to pick that up in a month's time or whatever. So I'm now in the edit suite. I'm editing away. and Still in Bulgaria. Just, still in Bulgaria. Still in Bulgaria for this this point. It was pretty soon after I, I went back and then edited with my great editor, Ollie Parker, back in the UK. And during that time, there was no sign of any pickup times. There was nothing. And I'm like, when's it happening? They went, oh, finish the edit first, and then we'll look at it properly. And a year goes by. and Oh, we, my we, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've now, finished, we've now finished the edit. <clears throat> I think we had two months to do that. So we'd done that. And they said, great, we're now going to do look at the screening. And I went over to Bulgaria a month later. And they said, right, screening in front of all our execs and the big people. And they said, gave us notes and said, here's some notes. Here's what we want you to change. And here's some pickups we want you to do. I said, yeah, great. They're all following my style. No problem. I was in a great place. It's like happy. Then they just couldn't find time to us to shoot because the next Jason Statham film came in. The next fallen film has come in hellboy then started shooting and every time was like we're gonna fit you in we're just gonna and then when they found a time my actors weren't available now they're all doing really really well or they've now cut their hair or all these things had a big impact so it was a full year later when we shot the first set of pickups (laughs) then we did another edit of the movie and put them in at that point millennium said we think you should reshoot the beginning because he comes across as a bit of a dick, lead character. It was a stag do. I'd got all my mates across to play the stag do guys. And they went, you're just going to have to cut all that. We want him to be a family man. It's better for the story. And it was. They were 100% right. But, oh, my God, it killed me to cut out this stuff <laughs> and my friends as well. So there was another delay. Now we have to reshoot that. We now need to wait for my actors and the studio space to shoot that. Two years go by. Oh my God! You're now. I mean, you're doing other things during this time. Of course. Now I'd made another feature film during that time. <laughs> you just, you think, is anything gonna come out? What? Ha- you feel really silly. You know, I'd started the film I guess podcast at that point, and I'm talking about the dare constantly, and I'm like, is it ever gonna come out? Is this ever gonna happen? So, I think it was, yeah, fully, maybe two and a half up to three years later before we now locked the final film. And then it was a case of now they're showing it at Cannes. Now we're showing it at these places. We'd already got sales in certain territories already just off the back of my first teacher I, te- teaser I'd done three and a half years ago. So we'd already pre-sold in so many territories off that. And it took that long. You know, that's just how it is. And in that, it came out in March in the US and Canada. And now it's October in the UK. And that's full four years after we first started principal Jesus. photography. Jesus. It, it can go I, and like i say i've had another movie two movies out in that time one that we did it was like five month turnaround this is four years and that's your studio my debut movie has come out after my second and third movies <laughs> so so another lesson we should be talking to everyone listening <clears throat> patience mm. <laughs> patience is so key because patience. Was like a lot of that time that is yeah. what this business does it will wear you down grind you little but yeah. and it's not yeah. a, sometimes it's a big hit but a lot of more likely it's the paper cuts of something yeah. like this that could just drive you crazy imagine if you had done no, you were like working aside you work in a starbucks during this yeah. time because for whatever yeah. reason the, your whole life is wrapped around this you were smart enough to start working on other projects and get other things developed a lot of filmmakers mm-hmm. i know don't do that they'll just sit for four years. Same, I know I know friends who've done the same. They've gone, no, I want this film to come out and be successful, and then I can get a bigger studio movie off the back of that. I, I totally disagree with that. I think you, sh- you improve as a director by directing. If you're not directing, you're sat on your bum at home. If an actor is constantly on set, a DP is constantly on set, they're constantly honing their craft and getting better. If you've not directed for four years, God forbid – you know, let's say the dare comes out and it's a, it was a washout. It wasn't any good. Now I've wasted four, four years and now no one's going to hire me. But if I've made two, three other movies during that time, people are now going, oh, cool. It, it doesn't matter what happened to that first movie. You've already had other successes or you've 
failures or whatever they are. Why would you wait? The more I've directed, the better I've got. Well, fact. Well, the, 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 well then I'm going to I'm going to play devil's advocate, and I, I completely oh. agree with you. But I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm like, but Stanley Kubrick waits seven years between movies. He doesn't direct That's all the time. True. And I, and I would answer, he was Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> He's Stanley fucking Kubrick. He's he Stanley. Can do what he wants. Whatever Stanley wants. And I promise you, because I know there's a direct, I know someone out there is listening going, well, you know, like some of these directors take three or four years between movies. You don't have to be directing all the time. I'm like, yeah, those guys have forgotten more about filmmaking than you will ever learn. Absolutely. And do you know what? Those guys <laughs> will probably be paid a retainer or they've been paid to oh. write scripts. That- by studios or on deals, all that. When you're not, when you're an independent filmmaker, what are you waiting for? Go make another movie. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. You have to be in control of your career because you, I, this is another secret. And Alex has probably told me this many times is a lot of these people won't watch your movies. If they're out, they're being released. They know it's come out. They can speak to someone. Someone say, yeah, it was cool that. That's all they need to know. They might watch the trailer. You think they're going to sit through and watch your movie? Why? They're going to talk to you about the new one you've got, the next one you've got. So it doesn't matter if you've made another three, four, five movies that maybe aren't as good as that one or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. You're making films and you get better. You work better with people. More actors want to work with you because you've made more films. All these type of things. You meet more people. It's vital that you as a filmmaker constantly work that muscle. That, that's my opinion. I know plenty of friends who don't do it that way. That's their prerogative and their choice. Um, well, I, I love being on set. That's why I produce as well, because you can be on set, right? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's the only thing that cures uh, or at least treats this, this, uh, this affliction that we have that is called filmmaking. Totally. totally. It's the only and thing. It's just, it, it really is. And just, I suppose, to wrap up the whole dare thing, as much as it's not come out in the UK yet, it it did massive numbers in Holland. Cinema was, I, I didn't even know it was on in the cinema in Holland. Pfft, huge numbers. I have no idea why, how, no publicity. Anyway, the, the, the good thing about this is this big talk of a sequel. And it all that, and we're really deep in, you know, developing it. And isn't that magical that some small idea I had in literally my loft here, two ideas, and it becomes something? becomes something real and tangible that people can love and hate and disagree with and argue about but hey you get you you get to be part of this magical world called movie making and you don't do that by sitting on your ass and you don't do that by going one day i'll write a script and one day i'll give it to a producer no you've got to do it and you've got to send it to those producers and find them and go to events that's how shit happens and and now during this waiting time you also made a a couple other like micro budget films. Where were the, mm. So, which is the one that which is the movie that that went to um, Showtime and Sky? And how did you get that to work out? So, this is called a Serial Killer's Guide to Life. And yes. just after I'd finished shooting the first block of principal photography on the Dare, my good friend Staten Cousins Rowe said, "Look, I'm making this movie called A Serial Killer's Guide to Life." would you come and help me produce it? Because they're acting it. And he said, you know, there's a few of the producers on and stuff. Come and share the load. And I did. And it was micro budget, but it was a wonderful experience for me at the time, even though I produced and directed a load of other stuff to actually go on someone else's movie and not be creative and do the nuts and bolts of making a film. The literally, how does a truck go from there? Who empties the toilet? Me. All right. How do you know all these type of things actors need to get from there to there? Okay, it's raining. We need to get umbrellas out. We need to put tents up. All this stuff is nuts and bolts of filmmaking, producing that a lot of people don't realize is producing. So I learned that and I did it. And we had a, you know, a great shoot and the film turned out wonderfully and got selected for Fright Fest and Scott awards across the board and you know four but five how did stars. You, but how did you get that microfilm to showtime and to sky so, movies yeah. yeah so it was a case of getting with the right distributor with that case so we did uh we knew it was good we knew that the buzz was great we were sending out little teasers and the buzz was really good on the film so what we did was we kind of did a bidding war in a cinema in london in a in a screening room in london and we got all the disputes to turn up and there was some really lovely people came and saw it and gave us some brilliant feel. And again, this is a movie with no real names in it. Certainly mm-hmm. not at the time. Now, um, the, the sister in Fleabag, uh, Sion Clifford, she's in the movie, but at the time, mm-hmm. it, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't massive. Um, and just some brilliant actors. And yeah, and we then pitched it to them and pitched it to the whole team of how we do this. And we, 
negotiate the deals. And Stan was Direc- brilliant. Directly or with a distributor directly. or directly with Sky? We directly and went with the distributors. Yeah. Okay. Directly dis- uh, talked to about how we're going to make this, fi- how we're going to sell this uh, film around the world mm-hmm. directly with the distributor. So we did the contract. Stan mainly ran that. And yeah, from that, that's how we got it onto Sky Movies and to Showtime. And what was your experience with this distributor? I always love to ask, was it a positive? Was it a negative? Did you get paid? Things like that. Yeah, it was very positive. Uh, Arrow Films are very good in the UK and very well known for that. So we specifically targeted distributors who we knew. And I did my research and homework and so did Mm -hmm. on who the distributors were for this type of film because it's a quirky sightseers Thelma and Louise type movie right right so it had a quirk it's slightly unusual it's it's got horror elements but it's also you know a drama so we made sure we uh, investigate who these distributors were to make sure that they were right for the movie um and I rang so many friends who'd worked with them and said did they rip you off did this happen and they said no um this is how to behave this is how to do it so we did that. We really did our homework and it's paid off massively. And so we could guys to life has done really well. That's awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. Really, That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And I was a micro budget. It was a micro budget. Yeah. And then you yeah. did another movie during this time period, uh, on Arthurian legend, low budget yeah. film. Because totally. why, because why not? Because why not? Because think- why not? Because why not? And also because when you, like I say, when you're making movies and you're around movies and I produced another movie in that time and I made another documentary called World of Darkness and, and then uh, the Food for Thought documentary, which you were involved in as well, we were shooting. And then, um, Signature Entertainment, who a friend of mine was working with a lot said, Hey, look, you're, you're in the mix for the making this King Arthur movie because you'd made movies. That was the be all and end. It didn't matter that the day hadn't come out. They could see the trailer. They could see the bits and pieces I'd made for it. And, um, they suddenly were really keen for me to come and direct it. And again, the same thing. I went in and pitched and went in and sold myself as how I could do this. And again, the same thing. They liked me. They liked me. But also what was really interesting here is I felt much more um, aware of my own ability. And I know it's a strange one, but I was also very much more secure of myself well of course look man you've gone down the path you've gone you've already yeah. walked the path a little bit like yeah i mean before shooting for the mob and after shooting for the mob i was a little bit of a different filmmaker you know <laughs> dealing yeah. with that adventure of the mob and meeting these big movie guys in la and stuff absolutely you feel something well, sometimes you feel more confident some other times you feel like i can't do this uh yeah. <laughs> There's that as well. But no, once you start getting it, you get a feature under your belt, two features under your belt. That's the thing I always try to tell people. I'm like, you know, everyone talks about Robert Rodriguez and a mariachi, but it, oh, that was his first film. Like, it, he did 25 shorts before mm-hmm. then. He felt really comfortable with the gear, with the, st- like the visuals. He edited everything. And that's the thing. You just got to get the practice in. And the same thing with screenwriting. Yeah. Can't just write one screenplay. Yes. You got to write 20. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah, it's not going to happen for you if you do that. Or you would be massively lucky if you do that. You know, like I said before, The Dare, I'd made so many mistakes, so many issues, so many other screenplays that had sat on my shelf now and never get made that aren't good enough. But I had to go through those failures to be good enough or to be anywhere close to good enough that someone would take a chance on you. And someone that took a chance on me with Arthur and Merlin. And yeah, that's now out um uh, mostly around the world, I think in the States in December. But yeah, I, I got to make an Arthurian movie about King Arthur. I mean, well, how brilliant. I got to bring on my DP from The Dare. I got to bring in brilliant actors. I got to bring back Richard Brake, who stars in The Dare, and bring him as Merlin and Richard Shaw. You know, and these people you just you want to work with and you're passionate about. And I tell you what, if you're good to them and you treat them well and you understand how an actor works, which is great. That was an actor as well, because I understand what goes through an actor's mind. I do understand when you're covered in blood or you've been screaming all day, how difficult that is and how, when you say, I need another take, they are going to kick off at you and they are going to be angry. So you've got to be aware of that and plan your shoots and your shots correctly because of that, that these people, once you're nice and good to them, they will want to work with you again. And it was so lovely, Richard Brake, obviously he's been in Game of Thrones and so many other amazing movies like Mandy and whatnot, 31, and uh, loads of really cool stuff. That He's been saying in interviews now when he's been promoting Arthur and Merlin, he came to do it because of me. He wanted to work with me again. And this is just a really important lesson for filmmakers is don't be that dick that Alex always says. Don't do it. If there's issues on set, 
keep them to yourself. Don't be the big I am. This is a team game. Mm-hmm. I learned that. It's this team. Everyone's in it together. From your, your production assistants all the way up to your execs, everyone's in this together. And you need to be as careful with them as you are with the money. You know, it's everyone's important. And I'm learning. You've got to learn. But don't be the big think you're the big bollocks absolutely well, not so I, I have to ask you so you you did the dare it started about four this whole process started about four years ago mm-hmm. so yeah, i've been actually, so when did you start listening to my podcast because i've been doing it for five years so did you like listen, were you listening to the podcast while you were making this yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing it's a huge inspiration and you were an inspiration for starting my podcast in the uk because i felt there wasn't a, an indie film hustle type thing in the uk as such that with an english voice and it was only after I'd done the dare that I felt even anywhere near able to talk about that sort of stuff. But no, I I was a full on indie film hustle fan uh, oh, all amazing. the time through that. It, you, a- it inspired me massively. You you were one of the people who you constantly banging on about go make a film, go do it. Stop well, yeah. So you saw you, you were like listening during when I was making Meg. When you were making Meg, and I, and the, the episode you did with the full cast for me was an absolute joy. Yeah. You know what I mean, all back then. Was it was a huge inspiration for me, and I imagine lots of other filmmakers. Out I've had well. no. I always the reason I ask is because there are other filmmakers that I've talked to that were like, "Yeah, you know, I made my I made my first feature around the time that you were making Meg, and I was listening to you while I was going through my stuff." And I always find it fascinating. It's just like, you know, for you, you know this as well as I do, man. Like when when you podcast, you just talk into a microphone. Sure, you sure. know. And if you interview, if you're lucky enough to do interviews, you you get to talk to one other person. You really mm-hmm. don't know how this – once you press publish, you really kind of don't know what happens out there mm-hmm. in, in, yeah. in, in the ether. And I always love hearing stories about you know email. I get emails all the time. I'm like this or that. But specific stories about like you, like oh, I was making this million-dollar you know, plus film yeah. in Bulgaria while I was mm-hmm. listening to your podcast. To your podcast. You know I was <laughs> totally in the rooms in these – on my own in the hotel listening to your podcast going – Ah, right, okay, this is how your guests have done it. This is what to go through. Because until you've made a feature film, you yeah. honestly do not know what it's like. No. It's really hard to put into words. We can talk about it to a blue in the face. And even when you did, I still didn't believe it. I still did not believe it. So, again, filmmakers out there who've not made one, you'll think the same. You go, oh, it's just talk. I'll be fine. No, no, no. No, no. no. You'll be dead. You'll be – your brain is fried. You have so much information you need to – Keep hold of. But, but the thing is, uh, in a studio. No, that's the thing. Like you were making your first feature at a completely different level than I was making my first feature. Very true, mate. Very <laughs> About five true. grand, mine, yours, yeah, a little bit more. Um, with the more. studio and you know storyboard artists and backlots and they're building stuff for you. <laughs> but here's what I've learned, Alex. There's no difference. The it's, end of the – there is, of course. But at the end of yeah. the – you know, hey, we got craft services. But at the end of the day, <laughs> we – it's just you and the actors, you, the camera, and the actors. Technically, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is. It doesn't matter how amazing your shot is. If the acting's not right, if the story's not right, no one right. will care. That's why people love Meg because it was you lot in a room doing it and the story was brilliant. This is, it, this is what filmmakers need to know is that it's all about the script. The script has to be the best it can be for the story you've got. The rest doesn't matter. You have to work brilliantly with your actors and get the performances you need so that people enjoy your film. And, you can and shoot we, on an iPhone. If you, absolutely. You can shoot on your dad's uh, old VHS cam recorder. It doesn't matter as long as the story's good enough. I mean, well, let's, I mean, you should shoot right. yeah, besides the VHS. I mean, let's just throw that out there. I mean, like, you don't yeah, need right. to. There's other yeah. options, sir. Go to Best Buy here in the States yeah, and then return right. it in 30 these days. days. And return it in 30 days and you get a free camera. I mean, there's these things. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't approve of that, but I've hey, heard yeah, other filmmakers sure. do cool. things like that. <laughs> um, and you were one of the few um, people ever to watch Ego and Desire on the big screen. You know, I had, I had a short film film festival run because I didn't do a lot of film festivals with it. But you saw it at the world premiere at Rain Dance. I did. I was there at the Rain Dance Film Festival. We obviously promoted it on our podcast a lot, and a lot of the uh, people who listened turned out. It's the first time I met a lot of these people as well, and they were there. And it's like, hey, so nice to meet you. And it, do you know what? As well, we're talking about the podcasting indie film world is. Yeah. You all connect, and this is what I've loved about doing mine, and and you coming on and. Everyone will message me and go, oh, I love Alex's stuff. It's so great. You're all connected. But all the indie filmmakers I talk to and you talk to, we all kind of know each other. 
we're all in the world of just going out there and making our sure. films. And what I've learned is that pretty much every single journey is different. Not one route is the same. Hey, yeah, at the end oh. of the day, you need money and you shoot a film. Sure. Amen. But there's, there's millions of different ways that that could happen and fall down and go up and down. And that just says it all. There's no, there's no secret. There's no like, oh, that's the button to press. The, 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 one thing I've learned, and I, I, I wasted a lot of time doing this when I was coming up, is I studied – I read – every biography about filmmakers I could get my hands oh, on. Yeah. I oh, watched yeah. every documentary about how mo- mm-hmm. movies are made. Um, and of course I came up and I think you and I have similar vintages. I think I might be a little bit older than you, but, um, but we came up around the time of the nineties yes, where right. the myth of Rodriguez, Tarantino, mm-hmm. Kevin Smith, yeah. Spike yes. Lee, S- mm-hmm. Soderbergh, Christian Singleton, yeah. um, those, that group of the nineties, Link letter, like all of the that that group, it was like every week there was a new <laughs> appointed myth, yeah. and and you're like, well, if I, you know, I and I, well, maybe if I go down the Kevin Smith route, well, that maybe I'll get that way, or maybe if I go down Mariachi's route, or and before that, it was like maybe I'll do what Spielberg did, and I'll, yeah. I'll do that, and maybe I'll do what Lucas did, or maybe I'll do what Coppola did. At the end of the day, there is no you could study all of them, and you might be able to take a couple. of ideas from each path mm-hmm. but the yeah. path that comes look at your path dude look at your path yeah there's no path Crazy, like man. that look at yeah. my path like my path i was like oh yeah i made my first feature because i was a podcaster like mm. after 20 odd years of directing commercials music videos and and, and <laughs> series and doing post yeah. on like 50 features and all the stuff i did it mm-hmm. was podcasting that gave me the courage to finally go I'm going to make my first feature because yeah. I had for, I don't know what it was meant to, mentally, dude. I don't know if this was yeah. with you, but with me, it was about, well, if it doesn't work, I could just go back to doing what I do. And, you know, and I was going to do it anyway, but like, I felt comfortable. Yes. I felt safe because I had a community. Even, even back then mm-hmm. it was 2017. So it was a smaller community than I have now, but it was still mm-hmm. like, I'm just going to do this and see what happens. And yeah. ah, what the hell? And man. also because you're, you're preaching to people, you know, you're talking to people about filmmaking. Right. And then, like I say, the difference between you before you'd made a feature oh. and after with your podcast, do you know what I said? It's like, uh, you could no, tell the difference. You, you could, could tell, so the, di- tell the difference. You could so tell the difference before mm-hmm. and after I shot that first feature, yeah. the tone. And then, mm-hmm. well, the tone of my pie, I'm sure is yours as well. It's changed. Like, yep. you go back mm-hmm. to listen to those first few episodes, first God, 15 yeah. to 20, I'm just... Well, first of all, they're horrible. I hate those first uh, episodes. It's just, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's just, just don't listen to those. Just ones. Ones. No they're point. brutal. But I, brutal, you could brutal. hear the angry, bitter filmmaker there mm-hmm. a little bit more. I was a little bit more angry and bitter. That's why I always tell people: if you, everybody here knows an angry and bitter filmmaker, and if you don't know an angry and bitter filmmaker, you are the angry and bitter <laughs> filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's so yeah. true. So you could it feel really that is. bitterness a bit more then and mm-hmm. and the grizzled voice and all the stuff in the shrapnel. And that's still with me. But after you made that first feature, as small as that film was, as yeah. it's like it's, it's really quiet little, you know, dr- you know, kind of mumblecore style film that I made, which was completely I've never made anything like that. I was always doing action movies. It was just like, I want to get this done. And yeah. it and afterwards I can't explain it to people. I don't know if you felt like this because I, I think that stopped me for so many years of making a movie is because I, I said, well, if it's my first feature, it's got to come out like Reservoir. Like it's got to come out like Mariachi. Like I got to come out mm-hmm. guns a blaring. And that was so much pressure to yeah. put on yourself as, an, uh, as a first time filmmaker. You can't do that. You can't do that. Would you agree? I totally agree. I think people put way too much pressure on their first feature. And I say this a lot to people I mentor and stuff like that now from the London Film School and whoever else that I'm mentoring. Stop worrying about your first feature being this breakout hit. How You think of all the filmmakers out there in the world. How many of them are breakout filmmakers? You could probably name the ones we've just named. There isn't many more. So out of those 100,000 films that came out last year, how many of them have broken out? None. Had they gone on to make other films? Well, okay, maybe 50% of them. Great. Be that filmmaker. Go make a film and make another one. Don't put everything on your first film being this huge success because you'll only fail by doing that or you'll never make a film. Well, I'm, I got I got lucky. I mean, look, I mean, you look at Nolan. His first film is the following. Mm-hmm. Not a oh, breakout yeah. hit. 
not 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 a break not a breakout hit. Um, so, you know, it wasn't a breakout hit. Then you look at um, Ridley Scott. Look at yeah, Ridley Scott, yeah. one of the most accomplished filmmakers, first time filmmakers in history. He had directed yes. what? 4,000 commercials at that oh, point in his life. Yep. And he did The Shootist. And The Shootist, a beautiful film, not a breakout. Not no. a breakout hit. No. So, but that was the myth in the 90s that kind of, I feel that independent film became independent film in the 90s. And I think so many mm-hmm. filmmakers still hold on to that idea of That's independent great. filmmaking that doesn't exist anymore. Like those guys, yeah. and I said this so many times on the show, Kevin Smith shows up today with Clerks, he'll never get seen. Robert Rodriguez shows up with Mariachi. Link Not Letter fine. shows up with Slacker. Not, the only no. one out of that crew that really might make some noise is Tarantino with Reservoir because it's just such a totally. it's a once even in a, then he'd already written a big breakout hit. Do you see what I mean? He'd already done the that first movie he wrote. You know, well he did True so, Romance. He wrote True, True Romance, Romance and and Natural Born Killers. So he yeah. was already a screenwriter at that point. Yeah, a, a published or a professional yeah. screenwriter. So, but it's just you can't put that much yeah. pressure on you. And us as filmmakers, we put so much pressure and so much stress on it. Okay. And when yeah. I finally just said, fuck it, screw it. Mm-hmm. I'm just mm-hmm. going to make a film and I don't care how it – I mean I don't care what happens with it. I'm just going to tell my story and go on. And my second film, Ego and Desire, yeah. was yeah. that in spades. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it was brilliant. And I really enjoyed watching it at the, you know, the, the premiere there in London. It was so cool. But the fact that you made that in a you know, at Sundance, who does that? No. Nope. Alex Ferrari does that. <laughs> As he does that. Hey, listeners, guess what I'm going to do? If you're not inspired by Alex, you're not inspired by anybody. Do you know what I mean? Go out, I appreciate you that. You can bro. go out and make a film. There you go. It, it premiered at Rain Dance Film Festival. Yeah. Alex Ferrari did that by just going, hey, I'm going to shoot a movie with actors I've not met. <laughs> with actors I haven't met, and we're going to shoot in it in four days. For in about four three, days. For about three grand while I'm um, shooting but, interviews for my podcast. Uh, um, so it was like a side hustle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is also, and you actually you're in the movie as a podcaster, which is even better. I mean, the whole thing's just meta. And that was, it was it's a, that's such a meta film. I can't even explain really to you. Um, <laughs> but obviously, uh, with all your future films, you need to use a star wipe. Obviously, a star wipe on, is. Yeah, I've got to that. move on. I've got to move forward to that level. Once I've got a star wipe in my film, I made it. <laughs> that's, where I need to be. It's, it might take me a while, a few more films yet, but when you see that Star Wipe... That's an, I'm, that's I'm, an inside... You have to see the film, guys. It's an inside joke, Star Wipe. But if you, <laughs> when the Star Wipe shows up, you'll just go... Yeah. There yeah. it is. Yeah. I was waiting for the little... Uh, the actual, You know the, the actual star that they have and then the star grows and goes out. I was, I was looking forward to one of those. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have the budget really? for things like that, sir. We didn't have the no, time nor the budget for things like that. Um... <laughs> No, I want to real quickly, I want to talk about the vegan documentary uh, that, yes. you, that you're making. So um, what's the name of it? It's Food for Thought? It's called Food for Thought, yeah. And it's on health. It's on the plant-based lifestyle we're having now. And it's on animal welfare. And because I have a, a voice in the filmmaking community and because I care mm-hmm. and I'm a filmmaker, um, I was like, well, why aren't I making something that I'm passionate about? Because the dare is, hey, the dare is a you know, a commercial type movie that has a, a message, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not, it's not going to change the world. It's not going to change the no, world. It's no, entertainment. No, and there's bullying messages and all that stuff in there. But Hey, I wanted to do something I was passionate about myself and Dan Richardson, uh, fellow vegan said, why aren't we making a movie about this and what we care about? And we said, let's do it. You know, he's a big sort of face in that kind of world anyway. And he's, you know, born free ambassador. So we've got connections and we were like, we've got cameras, we've got equipment. Let's just go shoot it. So we came up with this idea to say, why don't we get a load of ve- um, people who aren't vegan to go vegan for 30 days? We'll document their whole life. And during that, we'll interview people who uh, either care about this or feel that they, they, their cancer cured them or they, they got cured of cancer by going plant based. You know, we wanted to talk to these type of people who, by going plant based or having to care about animals, made a difference. And we care about this and we wanted to do something. And we asked you to be in the documentary as well, which you very kindly agreed to be interviewed. Yes. And do you know, and that's interesting. You were in the doc because obviously we started talking on the podcast and found out you were vegan as well. And we were like, right, right. We, you've, you've got to be in the doc. Um, so yeah, I, and we, we got some, we were worried about, cause we've, we've traveled around the world, you know, yeah. we traveled to Croatia, LA and Sweden and obviously London and South Africa. We were like, how are we going to, 
afford this. This is just us, and we want to do this properly and make this really good. So we did a, a, a crowdfunder. Um, we raised a really nice amount of money, but we were very clever about how we did that. Mm-hmm. Um, we specifically targeted we would, the riches are in the niches, as you always say, and we targeted the niches. We targeted vegan groups. We targeted animal welfare groups. We targeted health companies, and we literally did different techniques for every day, how we were targeting them, why they would invest, and then their that would spread out into that market. And suddenly we'd have money flying in from all around the world. And we ended up raising 75K uh, on that crowdfunder, which is ridiculous and insane. Um, but that's because we were passionate about it and our story came across that way. And we really worked our asses off. It was literally like making a feature film for a month. Um, oh, no, it's, it's brutal, isn't it? Crowdfunding is a brutal. It's brutal. It, Crowdfunding is horrible. We don't want to do it again. It's just, me neither. Oh. It's, it, oh, mm, it's rough. It's rough. Well, it, what, what that meant was that we could afford to hire in a, a camera team. We could afford to fly to these places and we can afford to spend that on marketing and use a lot of that money to market the movie and self-distribute ourselves. And the only reason I wanted to self-distribute this movie was because of Alex's brilliant book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. And that is fact. Honestly, oh, I appreciate that. About going, oh, we could, we could, this distributes are going to jump all over this when we were in Cannes last year, not this year, obviously. The amount of distributes were like, we'll take this, we'll take this. Oh, of from course the they will. They won't give you any money, uh, but they'll take it. Won't give any money. We knew that, but we went, but because this is the really weird thing about this, we'd rather this, and this is kind of not true, but we want more eyeballs on this because we want people to understand how the world is going to really implode on itself unless we all change and make a difference. So we want more eyeballs on that. So we also didn't want to self-distribute this ourselves if we didn't know what we were doing. And because of the book, we were like, we're going to self-distribute uh, ourselves because we thought we can do this. Alex, I felt you gave us that power and passion that we, we could make the money from this. And I'm not mean, and that money can then go back into us making more docs about this world and about how we can not necessarily save the planet, but save people's lives who are mm-hmm. eating the wrong kind of foods, who are not being careful, who are ruining the environment and animals and treating them badly. And that we can do that. Why give it to a distributor who's going to run off with that money? And then we can't make more films from that. Hey, people might know of the doc, but we want to continue this as a business and keep going. And you inspired us to do that. hundred percent. I, 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 I am humbled and I appreciate that. And I mean, obviously because the book, obviously I talk about the vegan chef movie. And yeah, all, and, and I'd want to make that movie. By the way. So, if there's um, a screenwriter who wants to write that, I'll make it. I will, I mean, I you know how many? I, I, you know, I think there's people out there listening who've read the book, and they're just like, "I'm afraid of doing that because Alex said it first. I'm like, I am giving yeah, free giving reign. People. It's a free idea. If someone out there can make yeah. the vegan romantic comedy that I, and I've laid out the story pretty much. It's laid out in yeah. between episodes and in the book and all this stuff. Yeah. Go make it. Just let me know. I'll mm-hmm. come on. I, I want you on the show. I want to, and I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you put out the business, the film entrepreneur business yep. around it. Yep. Just please. So basically please. what I laid out in the book, a lot of examples are with the vegan chef movie, which are like, and you could do this because it's vegan and you could do that because it's vegan. Mm-hmm. You I basically just going, took that, bl- that blueprint. I was like, Has he written this for me? <laughs> <laughs> this is vegan doc. And he's written this book all about, how a vegan chef movie could happen. I'm like, well, we can follow all that. We can do this ourselves. And hey, it's going to be a ton of work. But interestingly, yeah. since making movies, I've now moved into uh, helping other filmmakers get with the right distributors. And, and especially with all your wonderful Facebook group as well. There's so much amazing knowledge on there and other filmmakers helping people. Um, we, and luckily, we got amazing distributors on the day. We got the Horror Collective, who are just absolutely wonderful. And I can't recommend them enough. And what they do is they spell everything out and they give you a spreadsheet of where the money's been spent, how much money's come back in. Stop it. It's all there. Stop it. Yep. You mean uh, mean transparency with a distributor? Yep. Sacrilege, sir. Sacrilege. Sacrilege. Did they get kicked out? Did they kick that out of the distributors guild by doing things like that? (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, interestingly, Shaked used to be at Epic and now he's he's not. He's set up his own. Oh, oh, Shaked. That's a Shaked, sir. Chiquette's new company, the whole oh, collective. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I forgot the name. It was because he has a, was it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That's one yeah. of his branches of his new Yeah, company. so he has entertainment. So, so Chiquette, on everyone knowing shaked has been on the show. shaked has been on the show a couple times. He's a friend and he actually does care about filmmakers. And he's. He, there you go. He's, yeah. he's one did, of the good guys. 
he's one of the good guys. So I highly recommend if you've got a horror movie, go to him. They're, they've been brilliant. So because of making movies and helping other filmmakers, we've taken another movie to the Horror Collective, which we are now acting as sort of um, sales producers, agent. reps, sales. Yes, but more producers, reps and sales. But we... It's a better word, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> sure. But we, I now I now understand that world mainly, you know, from your book, but also from understanding that, and it's so important to so self distribution. Even though it's going to be very difficult with the vegan documentary, food for thought, it makes so much sense for us to do that ourselves, especially with Dan's reach being born free ambassador and everything and with my doing the podcast and my world out there yeah and the budget and 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 it's not an expensive it's already been paid for essentially so you're in the black right away already yeah yeah there's so much you could do with that you know i i one day will make make a vegan documentary but i i just like i was just like this makes all the sense in the world like it's i just think the the blueprints laid out i mean there's so many of these vegan docs that just built out multi-million dollar businesses around the oh, films. Totally, we, totally. We should give you a percentage, really, Alex, and maybe we'll <laughs> just send cash, toilet paper, cash. and ammo. Uh, that's all we need is ammo. ammo because we're American. Uh, yeah. For obviously, we're American, so we need obviously. we need ammo, toilet paper, and uh, just yeah. uh, 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 that's fine. And cash, cash if you cash. that's fine. Cash just is what you need, straight. Right? Yeah. Um, no that's wiring, right. just straight. Actually, pounds. Yeah. If you can send pounds over, that'd even be better. <laughs> I'll fax them across to you <laughs> by, by VHS on its way to you. <laughs> uh, my friend, we could keep talking for at least another two hours. Uh, this is what happens when two podcasters get together. <laughs> but I'm gonna, so I'm going to ask you now um, a few questions I ask all of my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Great question. I love this question. I say – Educate yourself on everything you can about filmmaking. Don't go into this blind. Find a project that you love. Understand that market. So if it's a skateboarding movie or BMX movie, perfect, because it's a niche movie. Target that audience with it. Understand what they like and don't like. Um, Get a BMX sponsor on board. Whatever it is, that's the way to make a movie as a first-time filmmaker because now you've got a chance of your movie breaking out. Not many films get made about gymnastics. Make one about that. Uh, you know, whatever it is, BMXing. Uh, I think that that to me is really important. And I suppose it's what I talked about earlier: is don't worry about it not being a huge success. Don't worry about it not being on Netflix and all your friends going, "When can I see it on Netflix?" Don't worry about that. It's all about your journey as a filmmaker. And I tell you what: if you want to be that filmmaker, that director, the screenwriter, the producer, it's a long career if your film makes massive straight away you might you might never recover from that it's too big who knows i mean yeah hey we all want that but it's a long journey don't forget that and find a project that's right for you find a screenwriter that you love and i tell you what you only need to search put a little email out a facebook out i'm looking for a screenwriter who's got an oh idea? no don't Who do that oh no that's <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah don't don't, 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 yeah, don't, don't, don't don't go hey i'm looking for a screenwriter don't no 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 don't do that guys please that's <laughs> that's that's a that's a recipe for disaster do some research yeah, go, there's some, some good there's some good websites blacklist slated um stage 32 where you can network and connect with other screenwriters and other um, projects that you might be able to work with. But definitely do not go on Facebook and go, hey, anybody want to make a movie? Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, what I mean by that is find the right screenwriter for your project, yes. wherever that is. Find exactly. That. And then, uh, yeah, and then find the team. Again, the same. Yeah. You, you speak to people, go to events. There'll be people then, there's another filmmaker, you go, hey, I saw you, can I see your short? And if the short's brilliant, ask him who the DP was and work with them. There's so many ways you can do it. But that, for me, that's really vital is know you know what film you want to make and then really target how you can really make a business from that and a great film from it. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? <sighs> Sign contracts. Um, <laughs> I, 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 early, early on, I didn't do this at all. And it was a huge mistake. Like I say, if projects got taken away from me. Things happened. If I'd signed a contract with these people, it wouldn't have happened. And even if that's on a napkin, and I'm sure you're going to jump down and say, no, don't do that. But it, whatever it is. And no, I'm joking. But it, I feel it's really important that you, when you're working with people, things can go wrong. When you're yeah. starting out, people do talk all the game. So if you've got something signed, at least then you're not going to get burnt. And within that, don't be afraid mm-hmm. to walk away. 
You might have worked on it for so long, but hey, if it's not working, they're not the right people, walk away because it's too short to be hurt, to be messed around. Go do something else. Have more than one project. That took me the longest to learn. I spent eight years on one project. Oof. Waste of time. Waste of time. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Uh, <laughs> now, what was the biggest fear you had to overcome to make your first film? Um, I think it was my own fear of not being good enough. I think it was my fear of not understanding my actual ability and my own courage and overcoming that. And, and like I say, not being scared. Okay. You were the actor. Okay. You, you wrote stuff. Okay. You put stuff on in theater, but it, it was that fear of thinking you're not good enough. But I tell you what, if you've got a vision and you've got an understanding of how you want it to be set out, even if you don't know technicalities of a camera or you've not worked with actors before, if you've got a vision and you're passionate, you'll be great. You'll be fine. And that to me is, that was my fear. And I had to overcome that. You know, once you're on a studio movie, <laughs> you suddenly need to overcome that very quickly. <laughs> and three of your favorite films of all time. Okay. Uh, Magnolia. Love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I probably should rewatch it. Terminator 2. Mm-hmm. And Slumdog Millionaire. Yeah, such a great film. I love that film. Such a great film. And plus, they're all very different genres, I notice. I yes. love romantic comedy. Um, I'm a sucker for that. I'm a sucker for that. Uh, I'll be you. making some soup. <laughs> yeah, you make a vegan, a vegan chef romantic comedy any day now. <laughs> well, there we go. We just need someone to write it. <laughs> and where can people... I'll, uh, I'll put that out on Facebook. <laughs> yes, you, yes, absolutely. Um, and where, uh, where can people find you, Giles? You can find me um, on Twitter is mainly where I do a lot of my uh, social media stuff. It's at Giles Alderson on Twitter. Uh, yeah, that's mainly where I am. Website is GilesAlderson.com. But yeah, my films, the films that are out, the Dare and, um, you know, the, the Arthur movie, Arthur and Merlin, which is cool. And the podcast, if you fancy it, um, is uh, the Filmmakers Podcast, which is on Twitter at Filmmakers Pod. Yes, I recommend this podcast. It's a fantastic podcast, uh, and it's a great addition to addition. the indie to the indie film hustle uh, podcast. Because if you get and tired of listening ep- to my voice all the time, I it's nice. Say the episodes with Alex, you could listen to those. But hey, you <laughs> no, 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 no. That's all they need is to listen to me here and then go listen to me talk more over there. No, I'm, I'm, it's 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 enough. Uh, Giles, man, thank you so much for being on the show, brother. I, I appreciate it and congrats on all your success and for everything you're doing for the for the film community. Uh, I appreciate you, brother. Alex, thank you. And honestly, same goes to you. You're an absolute inspiration and a joy and you're a wonderful guy as well. Um, So well done. Everyone, give it up to Alex. Well done, buddy. (laughs) Thank you. I want to thank Giles for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs. Thank you for a hell of a tale, uh, Giles. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 423. And if you haven't checked out his podcast, The Filmmaker's Podcast, I highly recommend it. Now, guys, next week I will be doing a couple more podcasts. I know Christmas falls on a, I think, Thursday or Friday or both, you know, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So I will be still releasing a couple of episodes next week. Uh, Look for them somewhere in the week. I don't know when I'm releasing them, but they will still be coming out. So, Keep an eye out for that. Thank you guys so much for listening. I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Holidays. And I hope you all stay safe and your families stay safe in this crazy, crazy upside down world and this crazy year that has been 2020. I cannot wait for it to be over and hopefully on to better, better things in 2021. I will talk to you soon, as always. Keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.